Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, Lenore Skenazy, who is joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Lenore is here today to discuss her book, Free, Will, Free Range Kids, Why Does an Old-Fashioned Childhood Sound So Radical? Free rangers believe in safety, and they also believe in being reasonable. We can gain the perspective required to allow our children some, some of the freedoms that we grew up with. Lenore is a Yale graduate and writes a nationally syndicated column. She is a former columnist for the New York Sun, New York Daily News, Mad Magazine, and has worked for NPR. She hosts a reality TV show called The World's Worst Mom and is the co excuse me, the co-author of Who's the Blonde That Married What's His Name? Please join me in giving her a very warm welcome. <laughs> I sound like a nut when you put all those things together, I know. Um, so thank you, Kim, for your watch. And thank you, people in the, um, you know, ether spirit. You, you should know how untechnical I am. But I have to say, I am a Microsoft person. And I wrote that book that some of you are buying um, <laughs> on uh, Word, OK? So thank you. That's actually why I called up Microsoft and said, can I please come talk here? And then Amy, you were kind enough to say yes. Um, you forgot to tell me I should put my speech here in case I have to refer to what I'm going to talk about today, um, which is the fact that um, I really am America's worst mom. I mean, you know, if you Google that, am I allowed to say Google? Google. If you search, if you, if you bing that, as we all do, um, <laughs> bing, 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 um, I come up once. No. <laughs> but if you Google it. Um, I come up for 35 pages, um, and it's America's Worst Mom, America's Worst Mom, finally followed by um, America's Worst Mother's Day Gift, um, which you should know since that's coming up. Um, uh, there were three things. One is uh, a McDonald's gift card. Moms don't want that. Lingerie, it's for Father's Day. Um, and the other one is the collected works of the Three Stooges. Okay? We don't want that. Um, world's worst mom, America's worst mom or not, I am a mom. And that means that I spend a lot of time talking to other moms, like three of whom I see here. There's so many guys. It is such a guy place here. It's, I once talked to um, a convention of, bus, of school bus drivers, and that was like the only demographically similar thing with the, you know, there were like three women and then all the guys. So I have to sort of readjust myself. But we moms talk to each other all the time. You end up talking about your kids or what's happening. <clears throat> And once I was talking to, a couple of years ago, my neighbor, one second, OK? Talk amongst yourselves. Mm -hmm. Let me do one really big cough for a second, OK? <coughs> Sorry, cyber people. Um, so I was talking to my friend Melissa, and she was saying, Lenore, can you believe she did that? I'm like, what, 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 Melissa? What, what happened? Well, here's the story. Melissa was at Costco with her two children, who at the time were um, ages two and five, two little girls. And the lady who was in line behind her, you know, with another pallet full of dog food or whatever, um, tapped her on the shoulder and said, oh, would you mind watching my son for a sec? Little boy, you know, with his feet in the cart. Um, I forgot to get enough tuna for Armageddon or whatever. You know, it's like three miles back. Would you mind watching my kid for a second? Um, Melissa said, sure. And that's when she turned to me and said, can you believe she did that? I'm like. What, Melissa, when I go to Costco, I can never remember what I want. It's all in those big brown boxes. Nothing looks cute or fun to buy. No, Lenore, I could have taken her baby and she would never have seen him again. I'm like, that's what Melissa was stunned by? That's what she thought the woman did wrong? And I was like, like Melissa, let's, let's just walk through this scenario for a second. Okay. Um, Let's assume, first of all, for the sake of argument, that you were a kidnapper, okay? Uh, one of the rare women kidnappers with two children of her own, um, waiting in a public place, using the sort of low-yield method of waiting for somebody to hand her a baby in line at Costco. Okay, say, 
let's, let's take that as a given, okay? So now all you have to do is wait for her to disappear behind, you know, the baggies. And then you have to, uh, let's see, put your own child down there. You have to turn around. You have to start grabbing the kid with the chubby little legs out of the cart. You know, ah, and it starts to yell, oh, you're scraping me. Ah, well, it's one year old, not yelling, but wah, wah. And then, then you have to take your own two-year-old and you have to have your five-year-old come with you. And you have to start leaving the store with a screaming child. And you have your two-year-old saying, I'm the baby. And your five-year-old is saying, what about the goldfish cracker? You said we were going to get goldfish crackers. Shut up. I got to go. And then you're walking by everybody. Excuse me. Excuse me. You're leaving your groceries. You're leaving behind your space in line at Costco. That's crazy. That's an hour you will never get back, Melissa. So you're going by everybody. Goodbye, cashier. Goodbye. And then, you, then you get to the door, and there's the lady who checks your receipt, right? And it's like, let's see. Are you taking anything that isn't yours? Yes, we're taking that lady's baby. Baby, shut up, kid. We got to get out there. Okay, we're not taking anything. Fine. You go to the door, and then it's it's the parking lot. You 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 got to find your car. You're a little nervous because it, it is your first kidnapping, and and you're looking, you're looking. Beep beep beep. Where's the minivan? Oh, there it is. Okay, you get to the minivan. You you put the five year old down. Two year old baby. Okay, you put the the, the five year old can put on her own seat belt. Uh, the two year old you have to strap in the top bottom side thing, and then the cushy things, and then the board book, and then. You don't have a car seat for the baby, right? I mean, you know, that's against the law. Melissa wouldn't ride a car without a car seat for the baby. So you sort of make a car seat, and then let's see how old is the baby. It's not yours, you know, because they're supposed to be sitting backwards until they're two, and then forwards when they're 2.1. And so finally you get the kid in the car, and you put on the Barney, and you got it going, and you got the Disney radio, and you gun it across state lines, and that is what Melissa thought was a sane thing to think about. And she thought the lady who said, will you watch my kid, was crazy. So that's my big question in this entire talk today, which is, who's crazy? The people who think that we can trust our children and our neighbors and the world a little bit, or those who think that our children are in danger, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> every time we turn our back. Well. I thought that that was an amazing thing, that she really believed that that woman was irresponsible. And, and Melissa told me that all the other people that she'd spoken to felt the same way she did, that the mother was irresponsible, bordering on negligent. Um, so I, being a newspaper columnist, you know, went to the computer, the Microsoft computer, and I, Microsoft operating system, I, oh, forget it. You assume that I'm always using Microsoft, okay? Let's just take it as a given. So I went to my computer, and I wrote the column in a white heat, like, isn't there something strange going on in our country today that we absolutely think that the worst thing is happening every second of the day? And I shot it through, and it ran in the Daily News, the newspaper I used to work for, and I got like three emails. You know, two people saying, like, you sound like a very terrible mom. Um, and then one guy who is my aged admirer on Staten Island who writes to me no matter what I write. And this time he wrote, um, I don't think you're crazy, but I'm crazy for skinny which I appreciated because at least it was an email, right? So <laughs> that was that. So years go by. I keep writing column after column. And then um, about three or four years ago when my younger son was nine, and I have an older son who never gets mentioned, so I'm mentioning him now. Maury. Okay, but the younger son <laughs> asked me at age nine, asked me and my husband, um, if we would please do one thing for him. What? He wanted us to take him someplace he'd never been before in New York City, where we live, and let him find his way home by himself on the subway. Yes, the, the wanted ride. And um, this, was, um, this was not something we had actually talked about before, my husband and I, because our older son had never asked us this. And we thought, that's a weird request. Um, does it make sense? Well, let's see. He's nine. Uh, we're on the subways all the time. We see that they're safe. We know that they're, they're crowded, but they're not dangerous. Um, he can read a map. He knows the language. He wants to do it. He's telling us he's ready. Okay. We decided we would. And my husband sat on the ground with him with the subway map and made him understand, you know, like, you know, the green line and the red line, this and that. Fine. So one sunny Sunday, um, I took him to... Bloomingdale's, which makes it sound like that's all I do on Sundays. It was our first time at Bloomingdale's with him. And because he wanted to be someplace he hadn't been before, so it's not like I'm constantly shopping at Bloomingdale's. <laughs> and, um, and I said, okay, hon, today's the day. And I left him in the handbag department. Um, mostly because to myself it sounded funny. You know, like, where's your son? <gasps> I left him. 
you know, I brought the purse and I forgot. Oh, no. Um, but also because if you open the door from the handbag department, there's the subway. Okay? And this is, this is a subway stop in a very wealthy, well-off zip code. If you, are, if you are mugged, it's to give you an Armani coat so that they can go get another one. It's just, it's a really well-heeled place. It was Sunday. It was the afternoon. And, um, and I went one way, and he went, I presumed, <laughs> the other way. Um, that's why people hated me, because I didn't give him a cell phone, and I just presumed he'd be fine. But anyways, that was the presumption. And in fact, he went in the wrong way. And he talked to a stranger. <laughs> and you know what he said? He said, is this the, top, you know, the side that goes downtown? And the stranger said, ah, I'm going to take you to Melissa. <laughs> no, the stranger said, um, that you're on the wrong side. you got to go up and over. So that's what he did. He went up crossed the street, Moses crossing the Red Sea, got in the other side, went down, went down to 34th Street, and the miracle is, that's where he came up, that's where he was supposed to come up, and he went across 34th, and we lived on the other side of town, he took the bus to the other side of town, and he ended up back at home, maybe 45 minutes later, very happy. He felt proud. He felt like he'd done something he was ready for, and like he had grown up a little bit which is what I think we all like when we're growing up, just to feel like, I did it. I did it myself. Now my kids parody me all the time saying, I did it myself, Mom. But anyways, um, so he got home, and with my keen nose for news honed by, you know, almost decades at a newspaper, I didn't write about it because it didn't seem like that big a deal. I hear you. What are you doing? Recycling? What is this? <laughs> right. That's okay. It's okay. Be yourself. We can all do our, do our own thing. Um, so I didn't write about it until like a month and a half later when I was facing a deadline and I had nothing to say about anything of import. So I asked my editor, I said, you know, I'd been talking to some of the other fourth grade moms about Izzy's subway ride, and they said that they wouldn't have done it, you know, until the kid is like 35. Um, why don't I write about that? And she said, okay, sounds like a nice local story. Hmm. Well, the night that the column ran, I got a phone call at home, and I picked it up, and it was, I don't know, I don't know how international this story is. Um, it was a guy named Joey Boots. Anybody, is that name? I mean, see, that's because you're intellectual. Um, Joey Boots <laughs> works for, uh, he, I didn't know him either, okay? I did not know him either. I have to <laughs> stress this. He said, well, he works for Howard Stern. And I'm like, Howard Stern is calling me? Eee, um, what about? And it's like, about that story. I think it would be interesting to Howard. I'm thinking, that's weird because I had all my clothes on when I left him in, in Bloomingdale's. And, <laughs> and, and I, I've never danced around a pole. Maypole, maybe, but a real pole, no. Um, you know, and I have all my own equipment, and I don't do it. Dogs, you know, whatever it was. I said, why are you calling? And he thought it was a good story for Howard. I was like, okay, you know, all publicity is good publicity. And I hung up. And then the phone rang, and it was the Today Show. And I'm thinking, how could the, the two shows be interested in the same story? I was thinking, it's like, it's like Kim Kardashian. Um, yes, what is it? And they were very interested in having me on the show. What they neglected to mention at the time was that, and then we're going to have this lady sitting next to you on the show going, oh, bad, 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 which turned out to be a blessing. But anyways, I said, sure, I would be on the Today Show. Um, and long story short, two days after the, the Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway column, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and, for contrast, NPR, um, defending myself as not America's worst mom. But being in the public eye and having people telling me, like, off the record, Ann Curry said she never let her children ride the subway and they're older than mine. Um, but anyway, so realizing that this was so so dissonant in our culture. Some guy called the NPR show, it was Talk of the Nation, and he said he wanted to know why that woman, me, you know, the pimp, uh, why that woman had put her son on the subway knowing that he could easily end up at the end of the day um, sodomized, murdered, decapitated, and thrown on the tracks versus wanting to give him a long and happy life. I'm like, well, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another. And, you know, I, 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 did I mention I have that spare son at home? And, and I needed a column. You know, this was something to write about. The fact that people were thinking about me like this made me start my blog. I mean, I, it should have been like, a, made me change my life. No, in these days, it's, hmm, something terrible in my life. I'll start a blog. Um, so I started my blog, Free Range Kids, that weekend to explain that I actually 
love safety. I'm a safety nut. I love helmets. I was just talking about them at, at lunch with one of you guys there who was starting to give me statistics on helmets and it was just too much. But I love helmets and car seats and seat belts. And when the nine-year-old turned 10 and we had a birthday party for him, you know, complete with a, a football coach because they were yuppies and we had to hire somebody to have fun. Um, you know, what did I give the kids in their, in their little goodie bags? You know, did I give them candy? Did I give them a toy? I gave each child a protective mouth guard, okay? That's the kind of crazy, evil, Knievel mom I am, a protective mouth guard. And I sat in the kitchen, boiling each one, shoving the kids out there, boiling water, go away, go away, boiling water, boiling it in, and then blowing on it so it shouldn't be too hot, and then sticking it in each kid's mouth so it should fit perfectly, nothing should hurt their teeth. And people are saying that I'm this crazy person who doesn't care whether my kid lives, dies, or is sodomized. So the blog begins, and that's when I start hearing about how much has changed in, like how out of step I was, really, with what was happening across America in terms of keeping our kids super safe. Like Because I lived in Manhattan at the time, I didn't realize that um, parents are driving their children to the bus stop. Did you know that? You know, same bus stop, same school, same house, but now the kids get driven there. And then the parents wait at the bus stop to make sure the kids, you know, make it from the minivan to the bus. Um, there are places in America where the buses don't even go to bus stops anymore because that's not considered safe enough. And so they pick up the children at each house. You know, like kids get to the school, they've, you know, they're throwing up. They've, they've stopped at 17 houses on the way there. And then some of the parents, still wanting to show that they're good parents, right, and that they care. They drive their children from the garage to the sidewalk. And then they wait there because that way they have the air conditioning on in case it's too hot and the heat on in case it's too cold and the roof in case it's too windy or raining. Um, then what I heard about from one school, and then I put it on my blog, and it turned out it's happening all over the country. Did you know about this? Like, so many parents are driving their children to school that then they pick them up. The, the line starts forming about, um, like, 20 or 30 minutes before pickup at the end of the day. Do you have this at your school? Do they do the thing with the walkie-talkie? Sure. Okay, I'll have you. The lines are pretty intense. That's my parking space. I'll tell you a parking space story later. But um, so what happens at these schools now is that the kids, you know, the, the bus kids are sent out by the kids. Nobody cares about go take the bus. We don't care. Um, but then the parents who care are waiting out in front, and they wait for 3 o'clock. OK, that it's 3 o'clock. OK, all the children the, the parents care about are put in the uh, you know, the cafeteria, or, or they're in the gym, and they're huddled there, and they're waiting, and they're waiting. And then outside, stuck in the cold, um, with her walkie-talkie, and I always think that they must do this to the gym teacher. I don't know why, but I'm imagining so the, the gym teacher or somebody is out there. And then, OK, it's 3 o'clock. The first car rolls up, and there's a name on the, on the dashboard, and it says Jennifer. And so it's like, OK, Jennifer, your mother is here. And then they hear, what? Jennifer, your mother is Jennifer. Come on, your mom's here. Go. Somebody takes her out. They throw her in the car. They slam the door like Obama. OK, off she goes. OK, now it's Jeremy. Jeremy, your mom is here. OK, go. Teddy, your mom is here. Go, go. And it's like, go, go. For God's sake, go. And I'm just imagining, like, helicopters, thunk, 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 and bombs exploding. And it's the Saigon thing. And it's like, apocalypse now. They're getting the kids out. Please get out while you can. Go. And this is what's happening all over the country in neighborhoods that people move to because they wanted to have a nice place to raise their kids. So this, to me, is baffling. I mean, when I hear about that, first of all, I sip water because I can never do it that fast. I feel like those parents should live in a slum because they're not letting their kids go out anyway, and they could save a lot of money, right? Just, just a, you know, rent an apartment in some terrible neighborhood. You can pick up your child every day and put them in front of the computer when they get home. Not that there's anything wrong with the computer! Right? And then, no, no, wherever you are, cyber people. Um, and then you can take them back the next day. But the idea that this is necessary is really weird to me, because crime is lower today than when we were kids. Crime is down. <sighs> From the if you were raised in if you were raised in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, crime is lower today than when you were allowed to go outside. 
Ask a question for one second so I can catch my breath. You, who's stealing my chair. <laughs> you have a question? All right, one quick question, because I actually swore to myself I would never interrupt myself with a question, but I will do one so question. Crime, crime recurrences or crime... Uh, crime rate. So, but you, you could have the same argument about crash car, uh, car crashes and plane crashes, right? But when you do crash with a car, with a plane, it's devastating. So right. when you're looking at crime stats, are you looking at... The deadly crime sort yeah, of Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at murder, I'm looking at, I'm looking at violent crime. But we're getting safer as a nation <coughs> in general. We're getting safer as a nation, and sometimes people say, well, of course crime is down because all the children are inside. But crime is down against grown-ups, too. So... My point was more, you know, you might look at the number of occurrences, but you could... Yeah, it's not like... Weapons um, and when right, it's not like, it's not like murder is up and pickpocketing is down, so I'm going to say crime is down. Yeah. Um, no, every, all violent crime is down. Okay. And now, having caught my breath... I will go back to our originally scheduled speech. Um, so it's not just that we're only afraid of our kids, uh, you know, to and from and, and being murdered. I mean, Boy Scouts, um, I heard from a, a mom whose son is a Cub Scout, and the Cub Scout leader taught them how to whittle. Okay, you know, here's how you whittle. You take a piece of wood or whatever you do. I'm a Girl Scout. I didn't learn how to whittle. I learned how to knit. Um, you, you whittle it, and then he gave each child a... Pocket knife. Are you crazy? <laughs> what do you want them to die? They're all going to do this because that's how we think of our children. They're too stupid to understand. This is the wood. This is your wrist. No, <laughs> they, they gave them. They gave them each a potato peeler. Okay. I mean, I I defy you to whittle with a potato peeler. Can you imagine like the or the Native Americans? It's like we'd have totem poles like this. You know, with like gouge marks. Anyway, so Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts, which I was one, were still allowed to um, toast marshmallows, but by law, you must have one knee on the ground, because otherwise, oh, oh, oh you know, you're just going to, you know, Joan of Arc, the, the, the troop that, you know, that didn't stand straight. So there's just, um, there's just a lot of weird laws out there. Um, here's the smoking gun that proves that it's not just me thinking that in the olden days things were better and different and we had more freedom. Um, if you get the DVD called Sesame Street Old School, anybody have this? Have you read my book? You're nodding along a lot. I've read your blog quite a bit, and oh. I was a foster parent, so there was a lot of um, oh, your lot rules. Of very intentional parenting. Oh, I'll bet. Oh, some of those rules are so crazy. It's like, like to prevent children from having any childhood, we will let you be a foster child. Yeah. But um, So if you watch Sesame Street Old School, it's a double DVD set from Sesame Street from... 69 to 74, and it shows cute things like highlights from those years, like um, kids playing uh, follow the leader, and the leader is not accredited, <laughs> believe it or not. It's, it's, a, it's a fellow five-year-old kid, right? No, no PhD involved. Um, there are kids who are riding trikes without helmets. There are kids who are playing in a vacant lot, and they balance on uh, a piece of wood, and there's no foam thing underneath them. They, um, there's one of those giant um, pipes and they shimmy through the pipe. There's like no homeless guy in the middle. It's just straight through the pipe and to the other end. And they come out there and they're playing unsupervised. And they're having a grand time because, of course, this was put on TV to model a halcyon childhood, a sunny day childhood. Oh, there's one kid goes to, Mr., you know, to Sesame Street, the Sesame Street, scary, scary Sesame Street where people live in garbage cans. And, um, and he, she, she gets taken around town by a you-know-what, one of those bad, scary things. Um, a man. That's it. Yeah, one of those, one of those pedophile, um, probable pedophiles who just happens to be male. Um, and before you see any of this, the kids playing, the balancing, the, 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 the games, um, this cartoon character appears on screen along with the words, um, the following is intended for adult viewing only and may not be suitable for younger audiences. It's like, it wasn't intended for adult viewing. It was intended for three-year-olds and four-year-olds, but nobody can endorse a simple, old-fashioned childhood anymore. My friend is a lawyer at Sesame Workshop, and I said, what were you guys thinking? You guys look like fools saying that children shouldn't be watching Sesame Street. And he said, I know. We had meetings about it, but in the end, they just, <laughs> the meetings, I know. You think you have bad meetings. Yeah. But in the end, they couldn't endorse it. So what I wanted to figure out was, where did this fear come from? Um, so that's what my book is about. 
available at the back uh, from lovely Lara. Um, and uh, what I think is, uh, what I found where I think there's four reasons that we are so much more afraid on an everyday basis than our parents were. My mom, my mom actually quit her job to be a stay-at-home mom and she stayed at home, right? She stayed at home. I walked to school, she stayed at home. I came from home from school, she was there. She was always, she was always talking to my neighbor, our neighbor, Mrs. Gaston, with the cigarette and the, and the coffee. Same coffee, same cigarette, same phone call when I left and when I came home, but that was, that was the life back then. That actually sounds pretty good to me. Um, and then I would go, after the cookies and milk, I'd go out again and I'd come in again and it was not you know, a federal case, like where's she going, what's she doing? Is this helping her? Is she gonna get ahead? How is that gonna look on the SAT? You know, so it was just playing. Um, so the four reasons, the first reason um, that I think our, our generation is so much more afraid is who do we always blame? We blame the me. This never works. The me -de. Oh. Ah! Yay! <laughs> now you're forgiven for your <laughs> earlier clamoring. Um, <laughs> right? The media has changed so completely since when my parents were bringing me up, because I'm so old, my parents were watching Marcus Welby. Anybody here remember Marcus? Laura, I know you do, because you have grown children, yes. Marcus Welby was a doctor um, on TV back when the patients lived, okay? <laughs> they, he would pat them on the back and they wouldn't go, you touched me, you know, now I'm going to sue. They, they wouldn't sue at all. They would leave the hospital and they would have happy and fulfilled lives. Now, if you turn on TV, you see 24-7 stories from all across the globe, the very worst stories that that the news can find, which is, I think, all right, we might not know Marcus Welby, but do you know the name Maddie McCann? Does the name Maddie McCann mean anything to you? Portugal, hotel room, no? Oh, you're ruining my whole point. You sure do remember Maddie, Maddie McCann was the four-year-old who was taken from her hotel room in Portugal? Yes, one nod. Amy, Amy she invited me here, she asked a nod. <laughs> right. Okay, the point is, if I say the name Kaylee or JC, or Maddie, I mean, the fact is that we all do know the names of children who were abducted, Polly Class. Um, we know, I think I could reel off five to 10 names without thinking too hard of, of kids who met the worst possible and Jacob Wetterling. My mom couldn't do that because the TV crews weren't going all over the country and then all over the globe to look for these horrible stories and bring them home. They're so valuable to television news, to um, what's her name, Nancy Grace, that they're like saffron. That's why they went to Portugal to get this story of the girl in her hotel room. It was a cute white girl who was taken and never found again, and her parents were upper middle class. This is gold for the TV stations. And when, um, when it's not regular, when you're not watching the news, and you turn on the entertainment shows, all the, all the gruesome ones steal those stories and sort of put them through the grinder. This is a story I haven't told anyone yet. Let me see if this goes over well. So, so Izzy was nine years old, curly hair, chubby cheeks when he took the subway by himself, okay? So then people start writing me like two months ago saying, did you see Law and Order last night? I'm like, no, but you can, there's this amazing thing called the computer and you can look things up on it that happened in another time, and then they come to you in the present. I think it's Hulu, um, and, um, <coughs> and if Hulu isn't legal, then it wasn't Hulu. But in any event, so I watched the, this, this episode that people said to watch, and, and sure enough, there's a boy who looks almost the spitting image of Izzy, who has curly hair, he's nine years old, he has chubby cheeks, and he says to his mom, oh no, the mom is saying to him as she let, lets him go, like, oh, I can't believe I'm letting you ride the subway for the first time. Did you see this episode? Yes, okay. And he says, yes, mom, I want to do it on my own. And did he come home safe and sound like Izzy in real life? Yes, there's law and order. No, no, no. Not only was he murdered, but at some point in the show, you see the body in the morgue, all white, and then they take off, the, I guess the shirt is off, and you see the marks on him where he was tortured with cigarette burns, and then because you have to sort of mush everything together that's in the zeitgeist, who did this to him? It wasn't a pedophile, hint, it wasn't a pedophile, so what's the other bad thing that's going on that we all have to worry about all the time now? Bullies. Did you see that episode? 
And of course, who are the bullies? Because you still have to have the advertisers. Beautiful white girls with long hair and lip gloss. So it was everything mushed together. But that's that's what happens on TV. You turn, you don't see. You know, the reason that my story was interesting at all is because you do always see the sad stories. It's like here's a child who took the subway. We'll tell you what happened next. Everyone's like, I know what happens next. He was murdered after subway. You know, after after being burned. Like, no, he survived. And that was sort of the news hook because otherwise everything is murder. I, the night I was watching TV just to see like what's on a typical night. Um, of TV so I could write my chapter on the media. First, there was a Law and Order episode that was worse. It was a rape. I guess it wasn't worse, but it was a rape. Um, but then I turned on CSI, and um, because I grew up in the Marcus Welby era, I can't follow the whole plot, but I can give you the plot points where some people were dead, they were in a swamp, and then they had to be pulled out of the swamp, and then somebody's in charge of counting the maggots, which tells you how long, you know, three maggots, he's dead for three hours, four maggots, so there's the maggot counters there, and then there's somebody else has a key to something really important that somebody else wants, but ha-ha, you can't get the key, he swallows the key, ha-ha, yes, I can get the key, he slices him open with a potato peeler, no, with a knife, he pulls out the key, and then he has to go to the beautiful hotel room where somebody is being drowned in a bathtub, and she's being held underwater, which is like the soundtrack for all the shows. And but she gets out of the water and oh thank God she's alive. But then oh they they dunk her head again and whatever, she's under the water. But then ha! Huh, she breaks free, and but she's so disoriented from being almost drowned that she stumbles around and she ends up impaling her breast on a towel hook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't you hate it when that happens? You know, you got out of the shower, you're nice and clean. Oh, my white towel, and now I gotta go to work, I gotta change. So this is what's happening on TV all the time. It's these gruesome, awful stories. And the Mayo Clinic did a study. They were curious about what's the difference between crime on TV and crime in real life. And they compared two seasons of CSI Miami with two seasons of real life. And aside from the the, the dearth of breasts impaled on tail hooks in regular life, they found three other discrepancies. One was, what was the one? Oh, um, in real life, drugs and alcohol are a big component of murder, right? Two guys get in a fight, bang, bang, they're dead. Um, but that's a very boring plot point. It was even boring here. You're not laughing. So, um, so you don't see it on TV. Um, two is that in real life, minorities are way overrepresented as crime victims, but not on TV because the advertisers want the whites. And three is that in real life, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you're sophisticated enough to know that the vast majority of crimes against children are committed by people they know, right? It's, it's both the abuse and, and the murder and, and the kidnappings even are by family members often or close family friends or step parents. Um, but on TV, the vast majority of criminals are strangers. And um, so either they're the, you know, the, the hulking you know, guy who's drooling outside the, um, the playground, which is why in New York you can no longer go to a playground by law unless you are accompanied by a child, which to me means you have to snatch a child first, <laughs> <laughs> then go play, and then take them. But you're not allowed to be on a playground if you're an adult without a child. Um, or it's the criminal mastermind who has figured out for instance, how to do an actual PowerPoint. But more to the point, they figured out how to go into Facebook and they're not bored by all your pictures. They're the ones who really look through them instead of saying, everyone looks cute. Um, and they look through them and they see that in the background of that soccer game, there was a boy in a jersey and it said, I can't keep using the name Jeremy. What's your name? Jim. Jim. Jim is there and they figure out the GPS and it's like, oh, he must have been in Ohio. And they track him down because he's the cutest kid on the entire web and murder him that way, which is why you can, of course, never put your child's pictures on the web. So it makes you start feeling like 24-7 our children are in danger because on TV they are. You really switch from one station to the next and you start feeling like any time your children leave the home, they need a security detail. And then that becomes us. So reason number one is the media. Reason number two is that we're in a litigious society, right? And you think, well, what impact does that have on our kids? Well, I'll tell you that impact it has on our kids. If somebody falls off a swing in a, you know, this park, then all the park just, you know, the whole park district starts worrying, should we have swings? Because they don't want to get sued if another child has falls off a swing because, of course, they've been pre-warned, right? Look, this child fell off. You already knew that that was going to be dangerous. So park districts take out swings. Try to find a park around here that has a teeter-totter or a merry-go-round. Do you know of any? We do still have merry-go-rounds. 
Woo! Yeah! And then, oh my God! <laughs> really, you got it. So much fun. Yeah, that's what gets yeah. kids to the to the park. But of course, if there's nothing fun, they won't go. Um, little Tykes makes these workbenches, you know, little plastic workbenches um, for like kids age like three, four, five, or whatever. And um, two years ago, right before Christmas, they recalled them because one child had almost choked on a nail. And I thought, well, that is weird. Why are they putting real nails in the workbench? That's, that's a strange idea. I didn't know they were doing it. But then I read further, and it was, no, it was a plastic nail that was three and a quarter inches by one and a quarter inches. And, and a child had almost choked on that, which I think is amazing. But um, I started looking around my house, and it's like, that's the size of my salt shaker, right? That's the size. It's a battery. It's a ho-ho in, in my house. Yeah, right. In your house, it's a battery. Um, right, right, right. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a curler. I mean, it's so many things are shaped that way. And, 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 and this is a toy that had been sold since 1994, and it was recalled in, I think, 2000 or whatever. So it's like 16 years of selling this toy. They had sold 1.4 million units of them. And to me, that is the definition of a safe toy. You've sold over a million of them. You've had them on the market for more than a decade. No one has died. That's safe. But that is unsafe in our society today. So unsafe it had to be recalled. When you get to that point, nothing is safe. My kids' uh, grammar school has a, an overnight for the fifth graders um, to take them out of Manhattan and show them that's a tree. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> give me a burglar. Um, so uh, then a little beforehand, they have a, a meeting with all the uh, parents. That's what we are, parents. And um, the vice principal was explaining to the parents what would be there. He's taking questions. It's like, excuse me, excuse me. You know, how far are they going to go? How many hikes? They're going to go on two hikes. Can my child only go on one hike? Can I have the phone number? How far are they from a hospital? How far are they from a trauma hospital? How far? It's like people were just going so crazy that he said, okay, okay, let me just tell you something nice. Gary Chevelle, whose cousin ended up marrying Paul McCartney, the most fascinating fact out of my grammar school. Um, <laughs> it's true. He did. You can look it up. Gary Chevelle's cousin. Gary Chevelle, though, was having this meeting. And um, so he said, listen, let me just tell you one really nice thing. The night that they're there, we have a, we, the kids gather around. We're outside, and we have a big bonfire. Bonfire! Bonfire! The parents are going crazy. What do you mean? And he said, wait, 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 let me explain. Explain. The children are seated um, 25 feet back, and there's a, a row of benches between them and the fire. And that's like, like benches don't catch on fire. But I was thinking, you know, kids are so far back, it's like their marshmallows are like, are like rocks, you know? <laughs> they just, uh, your, 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 your candy bar would not melt. You, you might leave the weekend still not understanding that fire generates heat, you know? <laughs> but, but this was for the sake of the children and to keep anybody from saying, look, we, we tried to keep them back. The fact that they, you know, their hair caught on fire is not our fault, right? It was because of something else. Uh, lightning. Uh, no, lightning. The point is that litigiousness in our society does change childhood. Um, and if you read my blog for the last couple of days, there have been all these other instances of like, why can't I let my kid walk from the daycare center, you know, the after school to Little League. It's 100 yards away. And it's like, well, you're not, you have to pick up the child, sign him out, and walk him over to the Little League um, field, which is at the, same, at the same daycare center, at the same school. But it's not allowed. So, so litigiousness has changed our view of what's safe and then also what's legally allowed. The third thing that has changed our um, parenting culture is the fact that we live in an expert culture. Right? I mean, there are experts who are telling us exactly what to do to raise the perfect child. And if you don't do it right, um, you are to blame for hurting your child, possibly, probably, irreparably. Um, and it starts even when you first get that first little test back, you know, with P, it says um, you're having um, a liability. Uh, no, a child. Okay. <laughs> um, if you read what to expect when you're expecting, which apparently a lot more people read than free range kids. But if you read it, um, it tells you that you should, um, that each bite you take is a chance to have a, a, a healthy child. Not, 
Not every day you should eat a little more spinach and a little less Kahlua cream pie. Each bite you take is determining your child's entire future. What do you get if you eat each bite correctly, okay? Well, each bite during the day is an opportunity to feed that growing baby of yours healthy nutrients, for which you get better birth weight, improved brain development, lower risk for certain birth defects. Okay, so if you eat everything right and your child comes out right, you can thank yourself. But if anything goes wrong, it's probably because in an effort to spare your child choking, your older child, you ate the ho-ho, and, and now you've damned the little brother who is coming along. This, the, the book, What to Expect, which is supposed to be so helpful, and it actually has grown from 400 words to five pages, to 500, to 300, 400, 500, fourth edition has 600 and something pages, and it boasts now with more symptoms and, I think, problems than ever before. You know, because you're supposed to be thinking about more symptoms and more problems. I don't, don't say problems, they do say symptoms. Um, but to me, it reminds me of um, that book, The Other Boleyn Girl, which is actually based on fact, so why don't I just refer to fact? Um, when Anne Boleyn has a baby and it's completely deformed and it doesn't live, what happens to Anne? <laughs> right, right, nothing good, right, worse, worse than going on the overnight with the fifth graders. Terrible, terrible thing happens to Anne. And, and it's because Henry VIII blames her. But I think Heidi Murkoff and Arlene Eisenberg are blaming parents too. They make you feel like either you're doing it right or if anything goes wrong, you got to look back and think, what did I eat that day when I was really hungry and I had a hot dog? Oh, I did it. And that kind of perfection the idea that there's this certain way to do it um, pervades so many of the parenting books, except mine, um, saying things like there, there's, a, there's a book called The Happiest Toddler on the Block. Like, ha, 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 yours is third happiest. <laughs> I think we can all agree I have the happiest child on the block. It's because I learned how to relate to my child. It says things like this, like your kid's cookie crumbles, which has happened for generations, right? There's an expression, that this is the way the cookie crumbles, but you're not allowed to say, oh, it's an animal cookie, right? So it's a little more anthropomorphic. You can't just say, oh, it's too bad, have another one. Or, oh, I'm sorry, we're out. Or, eat it anyway, it's just the crumbs. They end up in the, the, the stomach, it's the whole thing, you'll, just, you'll, you'll see. When it comes out, it's the same. So you know that it's gonna get squished anyway. <laughs> it, you can't say any of that. And frankly, I wouldn't suggest that. But, um, but what you have to do is if they're cookie crumbles, do you know what I'm supposed to say to you? Say you're crying. Cry. <laughs> wow, very good. Um, sad. 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 You're supposed to respectfully relate to the child's inner turmoil because only this way can you start to uh, bond with your child so that they understand that you understand that they understand that the cookie's dead and, and then you give them another cookie. But there's all these things. If you, you're supposed to do this. If you, if you take the kid's picture, right? The kid drew a picture, right? You can't say, that's great, you're a genius. Like, it's a horse or a spider. It's whatever, it's great. You can't say it's great. Because then the kid gets this inflated ego. Oh, I'm so great. I did. Oh, but that was when I was good. And now I'm not going to be good anymore. And I can't draw another thing. And I'm stymied. And, and you've, you've ruined them. OK? But you can't say, you know, I can't even tell. Is that eight legs? And it's not a horse. OK? Then it is a spider. Because this stinks. You can't say this stinks. Because then, of course, you've just automatically crushed them. So you can't say good. You can say good job. But you can't say good good kid or you're good or any of that. And, and it gets to the point where it said, the, the guy actually suggested, the happiest toddler guy, said, what you should do is look at the child's picture and take a few minutes. OK, and then think of something to say that is the right thing. For instance, I see you used the color green, just like that green shirt you wore at your birthday. Really, you're supposed to say that because it shows that you're present and you're thinking and you're relating and, and you were at his birthday party, so you're remembering a happy moment in their life. And, and all of that is what it takes to talk to your child about one stinking lion, dog, you know, a sunshine, uh, you know, doo-doo, whatever it was that the kid was drawing a picture of. Everything becomes your, your Microsoft job interview. You know, am I saying the right thing? Is this going to go well? And, and this is under the guise of helping us. 
but it really makes you think like you must be a real idiot who can't even figure out what to say to your kid on your own. You better read a book and use the right words and go through some, some role-playing scenarios so you're not going to harm your child by something that you accidentally said that crushes them for life. So the expert culture <laughs> drives us crazy. But the fourth thing, and the, the last thing I'm going to talk about that I think is driving us crazy, is what I call the kitty safety industrial complex. And I brought a couple of examples. Um, this is, you can't answer this if you've read the book, but of course I hope you all have read the book. Um, what are these? What are these? All right, you can answer if you, nobody else is answering. Elbow pads? No, that's tennis. This is for babies. Mittens. Mittens? No, that would help. <laughs> huh? Knee pads. Yes. These are, I heard you, but I couldn't give you one of your first dibs. Um, but he does win. Um, <laughs> These are baby knee pads to protect your child because you decorated the nursery in crushed glass. Um, which you know, It looks nice, it's sort of sparkly, but no, bad idea. But the thing is that these are on sale, and if you go to the One Step Ahead catalog page and you look at what it says, it has, it has reviews. And one mom says, this really helped my child make the transition from carpet to floor. Okay? <laughs> I mean, that's not having a lot of confidence in your kid or evolution. I mean, you know, also, don't you want it to sort of hurt their knees so that they have some incentive? Do you want them to go, oh, this feels so good, Mom. Mom, I got a basketball break. You know, you want them. <laughs> you want them to get off their knees and have some incentive to walk, but not with these. No. How about this? Yeah, right. They do. Actually, I, I did a story on that, too. There is a guy who came up with a onesie, with, and he put mop heads on both <laughs> knees. And that, I thought, was pretty brilliant. Yeah. You should always try to use your kids rather than the other way around. Um, so do you know what these are? Mr. Smarty Pants know-it-all over there, huh? What are they? I'm not going to show you. <laughs> huh, what are they? Come on. They're table toppers. OK? These are eco-friendly table toppers. Eco-friendly except for the fact that they exist. Um, made by Disney. Oh, I don't want to hurt this. This is my favorite package. Um, these are disposable placemats you can bring with you. What, what do they do? They provide on-the-go protection from germs, dirt, and cleaning chemicals on restaurant and food court tables. Let's read that again. On-the-go protection from germs, ugh, dirt, ugh, and cleaning chemicals. So basically, your child is in danger anytime you leave the home and you're at the food court and like you're scraping off the, you know, the burrito special from yesterday, bleh. or God forbid, somebody came through with a rag and washed down the table. Oh no, it's clean. Oh my God, my poor child. I can't put my food down on that. So they're telling you your child is in danger no matter what. Dirty or clean, your child is in danger. That's how we go crazy. Nothing seems safe enough if if the entire continuum of what the world can be constitutes danger. But this, this is my very favorite little example here. You ready? This. Do you know what this is? A rubber toy. What are you, 95? <laughs> right, right. This, this is the baby bathwater temperature duck. OK? This is it. You're seeing it. I have extra ones in my closet. God forbid they ever go out of business. I would lose my whole um, speech. Um, so this is a duck that if you're giving your child a bath, you put it in the water before the child. OK? Um, and then after a few minutes, you take it out. And if the word hot, thank you, <laughs> appears on this dot, then and only then do you know that the water is, oh, what's that thing? It scalds you, it burns you, it makes uh, hot. That's it. This duck tells you that. Because you, as a parent, couldn't possibly stick your hand in the water. And if you pull it out and, like, all that's left are bones, <laughs> you know, and there's stuff floating in the water and it smells like chicken soup, you know, that's, that's not a hint. You couldn't, like, what is that again? My hand fell off and I, should, I shouldn't put the baby. Oh. Thank you. This one will tell you what to do. But I want you to cut up here and read in a very loud, clear voice what it says to do under caution, because there's, there's some instructions on the back. Can you start from the word adult? Adults. 
adults should always place hand in bath water to test the temperature before, in capital, before placing baby in tub. Oh, the adult should place her hand in the water before placing the kid in the tub. So what is this guy doing? This guy is screwing with you. This guy exists to get 349 out of you when you come into Babies R Us. It's telling you that you are ill-equipped to get your child alive from day one to day two without buying something, using something, worrying about something that nobody in the history of the world had to use until this generation to keep their kid from dying. So that's why we're going crazy. There's a whole industry, industry out there trying to convince us that we are too dumb and our children are too vulnerable to make it out alive. So that's the big point. There's, there's all these factors are, are working against us and here's the effect that you have on kids. Let me see what time it is. Yes, I actually, okay. Um, here's here's um, a letter from a 15 year old that you'll know in a second. Um, this is the ultimate effect of us worrying and keeping them safe and thinking that the worst is gonna happen all the time. I'm 15 right now and get pretty much no freedom. I'm limited to what's inside the house and the backyard. I can't even go as far as the sidewalk. I might be abducted or killed. I used to walk to a bus stop, but my dad said it was too dangerous, so he started driving me to school. Today, after playing video games for two hours or so, I went downstairs and realized the only things I could do there were eat and watch TV. Watching TV, playing video games, and eating junk food are fun and all, but after even just a few days, it gets old. I've been on winter break for half a week now. I don't want my kids, if I ever have kids, to live like me at all. So these are parents who are so worried about anything bad happening to their child, especially kidnapping, that what have they done? They kidnapped him. They kidnapped him for his own good. They're keeping him in this bubble to keep him safe, and they think that that's what their job is as parents. I don't. I think our job is to raise, as my subtitle says, safe and self-reliant kids. But how do you do that? I'm just going to give you one quick example. Um, there's a teacher in New York City, um, teaches sixth grade uh, it's a magnet class. Uh, so sixth grade is like age 10 and 11 year olds. Um, and what she does every year is she has them do a free range kids project. They can do anything they want that they feel that they're ready to do but that they're, they haven't done yet for one reason or another. And it had to be um, extra credit because she knew that some parents wouldn't let their kids do anything at all. They'd be like the 15 year old's parents. But once the parents have signed on, they can do anything. And so um, she has me come in every year and read the projects. And kids do some things that were just, uh, the first year I read them, they were like, some were very, very, very timid, insanely timid. A couple kids made fried eggs. And one of them wrote, I was afraid I was going to burn down the apartment. OK? Um, some of them, you know, make a dinner. One kid um, was living in one of these big apartment buildings, but she was going far away to this magnet school, so she didn't know all the neighbors. So she said, Mom, how about? I go around our floor and I knock on everyone's door and get to know the neighbors finally, you know, because I don't know them. And her mother said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. They could be terrible people. And she's like, but mom, what if there's ever a fire? Then wouldn't you want them to know that I'm here so that they would come and get me? And the mother's like, oh, no, <laughs> the, the fire, predator, fire, predator. Extra credit, mom. Extra, OK, extra credit at the magnet school, OK. So the kid knocked on all the doors, and wouldn't you know it, she met two other girls her own age who became friends, which is very much part of what I want to see happening, people connecting. But my favorite project was this one girl who said she decided to bake an independence cake. And she made this big poster and said, how to bake an independence cake. You know, it's like, you know, it's always hard to get everything on the poster. So, um, so here, how do you bake an independence cake? Well, she decided that she would go to the grocery on her own, about a half mile away, which she'd never done before, get the ingredients and bake the cake. So um, she started out and she wrote that she was, um, she go, started going on, the, on, the, uh, on her path and she said, on the way there, everyone looked angry like they were going to reach out and snatch me. Okay, she had that worldview that comes to us from all the media that everybody is scary and awful. And then she gets to the grocery and you know, it takes a while. You have to find the you know, flour and the eggs and the butter in the back. And um, it took her a little, you know, maybe half an hour. And finally, she's checking out. She's in line. And the lady behind says, would you mind watching my, 
No. <laughs> it's the infinite loop version of my speech. So she's checking out, and she wanted to use her very own money because it really wanted to be by herself. So she pays with her own money, and now she has her bags, and she's leaving the store, and she wrote that the way home seemed so much shorter and more pleasant because I was already used to the walk. And that is my point for you today. We can give our children all the, the GPSing and the constant phone calls and the trophies for eighth place and Stanley Kaplan and baby knee pads and table toppers and you name it. But what really makes kids happy, confident, and just love their life is being part of the world. And that is our job is to open the world to them. Don't just send them out there. You teach them how to cross the street. You teach them how to swim. You teach them that they can talk to strangers, but they can't go off with strangers. But after that, you have to let them have the kind of childhood you had and the freedom you had, because that is how they grow up, and that is how you raise a free-range kid. Thank you very much. <laughs> Amy. Question. Um, question is... So they're not, they are real, huh? <laughs> Those people watching online. I've people online uh, mm -hmm. Where's your personal line between what's stupid to worry about and what's smart to worry about? And what she's asking, and, and how do you draw it? And she was specifically talking about things like skiing. There's so few ski accidents. I worry about skiing and I let my kids ski. Right, and so uh, several people online said absolutely you have to wear the helmet, but you know, it's rare that people actually get trees yet. So, um, I, I don't have a hard line, and I know that I, I really believe that everyone is going to have to draw that for themselves. That's not something I want um, a lot of rules to be drawn up for. But um, like a helmet to me is a great idea because it doesn't change the experience. They still get to ski. They still get to ride their bike. They still get to ride their skateboard. Um, all the things that terrify me, but I let my kids do it with their helmets. But um, that's it. Uh, in terms of like, how do I decide what's really frightening is I really try to keep perspective. I, I'm very scared about cars, and so I really want my kids to not be looking at anything or talking to anyone when they're crossing the street. I don't know what they actually do, but when they're with me, I'm always screaming at them. Um, <laughs> but does that mean I don't let them cross the street and don't let them, you know, ever let go of my hand? I think our job is to train our kids to be as, as safe as we think they can be, you know, train them to be responsible. And as they... As they show that they're responsible, then they get more freedom. It can go together. A lot of times now what we're doing is doing so many things for our kids. One mom wrote to me, she said, it hit her one day, why was she driving her kid to um, like the baseball game so that he could have exercise? It's like, like, just try to put things in perspective. You can have your kid walk to the ball game and then he gets more perspective, I mean more exercise, and you get a break. So um, my, my general rule is, First of all, let them do things if they can still do them the way they used to, but in a safe way. And then also, um, if your parents let you do something, like I was walking to school in first grade, um, and then the crossing guards back then were sixth graders, I mean, that was not a crazy era. Um, if your parents let you do that, I, I, I would question why you wouldn't let your own kids do that unless you think they are um, less mature than you are. So nobody ever wants to think that about their kids. So then they let them do it. Yes. You think about environment sometimes, you know, um, as you grow up, people travel and, and sometimes you relocate and things like that. How, do you, have you seen any research in terms of the impact on kids as they're relocating? For instance, I, oh, I have yeah, no, a I seven have. and nine year old and we moved from California to here. And you Wait, know, are we, oh no, we're not here. We're just, yeah, we're not Seattle. in California. <laughs> right, I was in, like, I was in California oh, yesterday. Right. Right. I know, it's on this coast. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, you know, and then you, you talk to people that are 35 and like, oh, I remember when we moved and we're five and it was crazy and I'm still traumatized from that. But you, know, you don't know what to do about that. I, so have you thought through that? or um, The only thing I, I feel bad about is when I really feel like kids are very resilient. I feel like we're all pretty resilient. Yeah. Um, and to, you know, assume the worst, assume that they're going to be um, crippled by um, difficulties along the way, uh, I, I wouldn't. I really feel like we're built to survive. I mean, that the knee pads come from the idea that nothing should hurt. And I really feel that, you know, you fall out of the tree, but you climb the tree again, or you're relocated and you make new friends, or you look back. I, I look back on my two weeks in summer camp were the worst weeks of my life, which I didn't tell the summer camp association I was speaking to last week. But anyways, um, <laughs> But now I look back on them, and whenever I'm sad, I think, oh, but I'm not as sad as I was at summer camp. So even bad things can be okay. I, I, you know, and also, 
the idea of not doing something that's great for the rest of the family because it's bad for your kid is, um, you know, that doesn't make sense. That's making everything, the fo child is the focus. Oftentimes the child doesn't even know what's best. You're the adult, and if you think it makes sense to move, move and, you know, you should move to another country and then they learn another language. I wish I did that. You know, I wish my kids got Spanish automatically instead of being shoved into them. So I think you're okay. Yes? Have you done any um, analysis into linking these concepts to childhood depression, obesity, antisocial behavior, that kind of stuff? Um, I haven't done a lot of research on that because, uh, for two, but there are people who have. Um, there's a really good book. Um, first, you should buy mine, but second on the list should be um, A Nation of Wimps by a woman named Hera Morano. And she talked to um, like the psychology, like student health services at a bunch of colleges across the country and found that the kids coming in are called teacups now because they look beautiful, but they break. You know, instead of being a frosty mug, they just break um, when they get to college because they're so delicate and they haven't ever done anything on themselves for themselves. Not that teacups do things for themselves. Um, but I don't like... Um, I don't like pursuing that, uh, that course of study because I feel like the other thing is we, we get into our mind that it is us creating these children. And if we've crippled them or if they're, if they're anxious or depressed or fat or anything, it's all our fault. And I feel like that adds more pressure to us as parents. And it's also wrong. I mean, your kids come out, if you have more than one kid, you know they come out differently. And some are good at this and some are good at that. And, you know, they go through ups and downs, and, and assuming that it's all us also assumes that we've created exactly who they are. One, it's their environment and their genes and their brother and their teachers. So, um, you know, I do think that it's good for kids to spend time outside um, and to be independent and to make things on their own and to do things on their own. But I would never say we're, you and I are crippling our children by doing X, Y, or Z, unless you actually cripple them. Right. Don't cripple them. Yes. I mean, cripple. No, I meant the media. Sorry, go. Um, yeah, I must disclose I'm not a parent, but That's okay. I am a university professor, so I feel like I'm yeah. cleaning up after parents. Ah. Um, <laughs> so um, you've been speaking about kind of the septic environment that kids seem to inhabit these days, and mm -hmm. I wasn't as aware of that because I'm not... I wasn't aware of it until I started doing this, but, yeah. Um, what I observed from afar is uh, when I was a kid, I had an enormous amount of unstructured time. Um, which was incredibly important for my intellectual development. I mean, you know, I was just, there was time that was not accounted for. Right, and right. I was out either, I'm sure I was doing dangerous stuff, but. Uh, I, I think everyone's going to nod along. Didn't we all have that? Like time where you were just outside and then you came back when the street you know, lights came on? We were down in the stream or, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And, um, you know, learning about the world around us. Right, without was, learning, it was yes. Unstructured. And now I see parents, they they drag their kids from lessons, you know, they got the music lessons and then the Mandarin. soccer, and mm -hmm. then it's like they're never right, the alone. Days. Right, I know, never, to, I know. Do, you know, just, and right. I don't see how, to me, it seems like that would stunt their intellectual growth. I, I do believe that, and what I have studied is sort of the importance of play. Right. Um, and what I've, you know, boiled down, it turns out that um, you know, you think you're giving your children all these great experiences, and some of them are great. I mean, if you can learn Mandarin or learn the piano, if the kids show some aptitude, mine didn't, they had to drop out. Um, that's great, but, but when kids are just free on their own, either discovering stuff or playing with each other, I mean, when you're just, when there are no sort of set goals, that's when your mind opens up. That's actually what I wanted to see here, if I could wander around. Just like, you know, come up with ideas or start thinking. That's like why we get our best ideas in the shower. That's unstructured time, right? That's when you don't have a deadline. You're not at your desk. Your mind just goes and you think like, oh, you know, new ideas come to you. Well, that happens with kids too. And when they're playing with each other, all these other things come into to blossom like communication, compromise, I want to play kick the can, you want to play kick the squirrel, don't do that. Um, and, um, and also uh, what they say is that when kids are playing, and I know I'm segueing from just free time to kids playing with each other without a parent or a coach, when kids are playing with each other, um, they say that that is uh, a really important thing because if I if I take three swings, right, and I, I flub them all, and I'm with my mom, my mom will say, ah, oh, take another. You know, oh, you could, oh, the sun is in your eyes. Oh, come on, I don't want to play. You play. You keep swinging. But if I'm with a bunch of kids, what are they going to say? 
your, your turn is up, go to the end of the line. At which point I would have a choice. I could either throw a tantrum, go home, or suck it up and go to the end of the line. If I throw the tantrum and go home, I don't get to play anymore. And play is this incredible drive in kids. They love to play. So the only alternative is to go to the end of the line. And when they do that, it's, it's the seeds of maturity. It's the seeds of paying attention and playing by the rules, literally. And that's what they call, in the, in the child development world, they call it um, self-regulation or executive function or whatever they call it. You recognize it as a kid who can hold it together instead of saying, it's my turn still, or I want another cookie, or whatever. So what you want is kids either on their own exploring or with their friends playing a game or just hanging out together. Those are very rich environments for them. And I keep thinking in terms of rich, what am I going to do for a living? I, I keep thinking, couldn't I have an after-school program where you would drop your children off and I wouldn't supervise them? Um, <laughs> right? And I could charge like $300 for a semester, and they would come, and I would be at my computer, which is what I do anyway, and then they would be out back or at the park. You know, I, I'm the one who created Take Our Children to the Park and Leave Them There Day. Have you heard about my holiday? This year it'll be the third year. Um, Front page of the New York Daily News, crazy mom's idea, um, where I said, let's just have a day when uh, it's, it's the Saturday before Memorial Day. Um, at 10 in the morning at your local park, drop off your kid. And that way, your kid will meet the other kids in the neighborhood, and they won't have you there to say, OK, now we're going to have two teams. Let's see, you're going to be on this team, you're going to be on that team. They're going to have to be so bored that they come up with something to do. And once they do, they're going to be so happy that they're going to want to do it the next day. So that's just spread the word. Spread the word, ether people, um, about that holiday. Because I do believe that time on their own is critical. And it's so ironic, because we think we're giving them everything by giving them, by filling up even the cracks in their schedule. And, and in fact, there's something very much to be said for chilling. Yes? I am a parent. Ha! And <laughs> I've got two children that we try to give as much unstructured time as we can. They have structured stuff they like to do. Mm -hmm. All of them is they're the only kids in the neighborhood. I know. Yeah. 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 Time. So now there is nothing to do. I know. I know. That's why we have to start a movement. That's why you guys, you know, get out there and, and spread the word. I actually have a son who, I just wrote a column about this too. Um, every day after school, the, the, he's now he's just turned 14, he wants to have a football game. And everybody, oh, I'm going to soccer, oh, I'm going home, I'm watching YouTube, I'm doing, um, or, or lessons. And so we finally had to sign him up for the, $450 football game program at the, you know, next to the school because that way there's a quorum of kids who want to play. I know, I know. It's, it feels like a losing battle, but that's why we do have to, I and mean, that's why I give these talks. That's why I wrote the book, you know, to sort of spread the word that if you can find two other parents who live in the neighborhood whose kids want to do that too, maybe that could be the seeds of something. I always think of it as like planting, replanting um, wildflower seeds, you know, like they used to grow and then they stopped growing. Now we have to spread them around again. It's like that's what I want us to do is spread the, the wildflower of kids playing on their own again. Yes? I think it's interesting talking about that. I have a 14-year-old. We live in, in a very suburbia neighborhood. But no other kids go out and play. Oh, they're empty. So if he wants yeah. to play and talk to kids, you know what he does in their unstructured time? Yeah. Yeah. They can chat on Facebook or they can play games online. But right. heaven forbid they go walk three blocks to the local park to play a game, especially kids whose both their parents work. They're not allowed out the front door until their parents are home. So even that period from three to five, and these are 13, 14, and 15. That's miles, just right? outrageous. 13 is the age Juliet was supposed to get married, you know. Um, and look what happened with her unstructured time. But anyway, huh, scratch that. Um, <laughs> the point is we are treating our children like they're completely fragile. Like the minute they walk out the door, they're going to step on a landmine. And we are lucky enough to live in the country where they don't step on landmines when they walk out the door. And like I said at the beginning of this lecture, the kids are safer than when we were growing up, safer from those violent crimes. And, um, and the fact is that it's good for them. It's good for them intellectually. It's good for them physically. Kids who spend more time outside even have less myopia than kids who are inside. And so I'm just asking you, because I'm wondering how to spread the word. I have a TV show. It's, 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 it spreads this word. It's in the rest of the world. They haven't bought it in America yet. 
It's in pretty much every country except America. I think America is just so worried and we keep exporting this fear. And so I'm going around talking to roomfuls of people and writing the book and the blog and saying, Please connect with other people who think like you. Show them that it's not crazy. Show them that it's safe and wholesome. Good for you. It gives you some free time. Good for them. It gives them some free time. How would you feel if you left home for work? I mean, you left work for home, and then your boss was still there telling you what to do all night long. That's what we're doing with them. We just happen to be the bosses of our kids. Spread the word. Yes. I have a six-month-old son. That's my first kid. Oh, so you guys aren't married? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. I was wrong. <laughs> Co-workers. Okay. Um, so I absolutely love what you're saying. It totally resonates with me. It's mm -hmm. the way I was raised. Uh, what can I do with such a young child to start this philosophy and... and, and... <laughs> Don't <laughs> <laughs> but what, what can I do to... to you know, six months, you got to supervise. The free-range lifestyle with my child, you know. Yeah, I don't know if it's a free-range. I, I always say, like, just talk to older people and see what they did and, you know, see if what they did makes sense. You know, one of the things I suggest doing in my book, and I don't know if anyone has ever done it, is, like, walk around Babies Are Us with your oldest living relative and say, like, did you have... That? I mean, like, if spoons now, that the color changes if the food is hot in the spoon, you know? And I just read... Now there's another... There's, like, spoon obsession in our culture. There's this new spoon that pivots because it says... Because a child simply cannot, the way they're built, hold a spoon and get it to their mouth. And it always strikes me that everything... <laughs> It's really, so it pivots, and then gradually you can pivot it so that it's back to where like, it would be, like when they're 19, they can use it like this. Ah, close. Um, it's just everything in there is based on the assumption that your kid is, is going to fall behind. Um, it's, it's very interesting to me intellectually, and Mr. Professor, get some person to do their PhD on this, how everything from the special needs world migrates to the, what is it, neurotypical world. Um, from, from monitors, that there's now this onesie that you can have your baby sleep in that will text you if their heart rate changes or their temperature changes or their breathing changes. And that's not for a child who is in the NICU. It's for your child at home in the, you know, the very, very scary crib. And then in the room, there's monitors and monitors that go not just sound but but visual, and now they're not just visual, they're infrared, and now they're not just infrared, they're scanning. So they're scanning the room, you know, which makes sense if you're like Osama bin Laden's baby, you know, <laughs> but it's just all, the assumption is that your child is about to die or fall behind, which is equally terrifying to modern day middle America. Yes? Uh, when you think about the obsession on knowledge, you know, we often think, oh, we want our kids to know everything, be ahead, and so forth. Any research or any observation you have on the stuff that they should actually learn? When I think about in school, you know, some kids are proud to, of course, know calculus and things like mm -hmm. that. Some others might be... Who uses calculus? Oh, wait. City. <laughs> you, know, you know, things that in, seem to make them smart, but actually they're not. It's just remembering right. hard facts. And um, you can spend their time doing other things. Yeah, no, I don't have any hard and fast rules on what they should be learning or not, but I would go back to what we were originally talking about, that some of the time that we're shoving extra information into them, they would be getting information just by being on their own, by thinking or reading. I spent an inordinate amount of time looking for four-leaf clovers. I can't exactly say how that got me ahead, but, you know, there was something to it. It was just free time. It, it didn't stymie me. Um, I do know that like, just because your kid learns to read at age three versus age five or age seven, that makes no difference down the line. So the idea of showing them flashcards, you know, but everything has flashcards on it, all the, all the, the, the um, placemats, there are cups with, uh, there, there's Sesame Street paper plates that have addition and subtraction on them. Everything is geared towards, I go to the toy fair, you can't buy a, you know, a ball without it saying, you know, helps uh, stimulate, you know, neuron transmitting, blah, blah, blahs. And it's like, really, they'll, they'll be okay just playing with, you know, banging on this. Jimboree drives me crazy because it says that it has <clears throat> experts who will teach your children to play in a safe environment. And it's like, first of all, you need experts. Secondly, you need somebody to teach your kid to play. Thirdly, the only safe environment is Jimboree. I mean, all this, <laughs> all this stuff is constantly coming at us. And I feel like it's this 
brainwashing, but if you say it, I don't mean it to be insulting because I got brainwashed too and I had a baby monitor in the room and I signed my kids up for mommy and me music that was just horrible. So I get, I, I get sucked into it too, but I'm just trying to say that I don't blame individuals for worrying about all this stuff. I blame this weird culture with all these you know, layers of worry and I'm just trying to take us out of it for a second and say, you know, do we really need all that? You know, Einstein played with cards. They weren't flashcards, they were cards. He made card houses. That seems like a pretty big waste of time. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Bye, bye.